Thank you for giving us opportunities each day to show love and forgiveness to others. We thank you for increasing your presence and understanding our lives so that we may grow in knowledge and in grace. Lord, you are great and no one can measure your greatness. And we will praise you, Lord, with our whole hearts. We will praise your holy name. And we will never forget the good things you do for us. You forgive all of our sins. You heal all of our diseases. You crown us with loving kindness and tender mercies. You fill our lives with your goodness. Righteous Father, your word says that we are to be patient with the faults of others and forgive anyone who offends us. We remember that you forgave us and we must forgive others. We pray that you will help us be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slower still to anger. We will make a commitment, Lord, to intentionally show your love for each other and for our family members and friends because we know that love covers a multitude of sins. And in the places where we know we're failing in our Christian walk with you, we know that we can love people as you command. We will not copy the behavior and customs of this world. Instead, we will continually pray that we will be transformed into a new people through the power and the grace of your Holy Spirit. We will strive not to worry about anything. Instead, we will pray about everything. We will turn to our God first and to the world's Google last for answers to our questions. We will tell you what we need and thank you for all you have already done. Through prayer and praise, we are strengthened. And may we please be refilled daily with your joy. In the midst of the darkness, bring us light. In the midst of the trouble, bring us the peace that passes understanding. Adonai, help us to understand that you love us unconditionally and that you are a forgiving God. And we must be forgiving as you are. Lord, reveal any anger that is in our hearts, any hurt we are holding on to, and we will release it now in the presence of the cross of Christ released and forgiven to be remembered no more with your help by your spirit we know this is possible and so we ask heavenly father for you to help us with this now help us better understand the danger of unforgiveness touch and renew our hearts so that we can release the past fully forgiving others of any offense and look forward to the future with you Give us the peace and freedom that comes from letting go of the anger and allowing you to replace it in our hearts with your love. Father, please forgive us for all acts of sinfulness that we have done this week, including jealousy and contempt, pride, bitterness, and hatred, malice and holding grudges. Forgive us when we engage in acts of unforgiveness. Forgive us when we seek arguments. We offer criticism. Forgive us the times we have lied, gossiped, or been vengeful within our own family, friends, and community. Forgive us for expecting to be forgiven by you when we have chosen not to forgive others in our lives. We pray that the Holy Spirit who reveals all things and makes them known will reveal now how we can better pray for those around us. Help us, Lord, be known for our prayer for others. And Lord, now we bring the concerns of others before you, and we ask for your mercy. We know that everybody we're talking about here has baffled medical science with their problems, but not you, Lord. And we stand before an eternal and almighty God, and we know that you are able, and perhaps you even will, but even if you don't, we will still love you. But we lift up David, Lord, that you will heal the incision from the surgery and make it Make it so he does not have to lose his foot. We pray for Alexa. The good reports would have just begun, but we believe will continue to come as you heal her and bring her back to full health, Lord. But more importantly, that you reach into her life right now and teach her what you need her to learn. Help her, Lord. Help her in her righteousness. Help her grow closer to you through this all. Lord, we lift up Jeff Scott. 
who has a detached retina surgery scheduled and is concerned. Remind him, Lord, that you are with him always. We pray for Bill Mora. We pray that he will continue to heal quickly so that he will be able to get home. We lift up young Sakone and we thank you for being with them in that time of their despair. And Lord, we know that the hope is actually not in this medicine anyway. It's in you. And the doctor does not get the final word in young Sakone's life. You do. So we pray, Lord, that your word will be healing and you'll bring back to full health. We have lift up Shelley, Lord, with her dizziness. Help her, Lord, to not only get better, but to get closer to you. And finally, Lord, we pray for El. His spiritual heart is fine, Lord, but his physical heart needs your touch. We pray you will heal him. And now as we move from praise to prayer to your holy word, we pray that you will still our souls, open our hearts, and let us learn and be healed by your word. For we know that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord our God. Holy Spirit, take over the service. Let your words be spoken as you bring us heart to heart with the living God this morning. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Scripture reading is short today, but it comes from Hebrews. Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. We are on week number five of the Power Prayer series, and I thought this was going to be a completely different sermon today. I apologize to all the people I talked about what this is going to be about because it's not about that. Changed on Thursday. That happens sometimes. I may yet preach that sermon. I got slides for it, but this is the sermon we're preaching today. We've been going through the Lord's Prayer. In fact, let's go through it together right now. I got you extra extracurricular here, uh, reading of the scriptures. Let's all say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And depending on your translation, you might just say deliver us from evil. And depending on your translation, you might even have this flourish at the end, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. But that's not part of the early scriptures, and they now think a monk added that. Okay, that's the Lord's Prayer. The Our Father for all of you Reformed Catholics. And it is the model prayer. And we've been going through it kind of line by line here. We are on this one here, this forgive us our sins. It was kind of a challenge for me because I talk about this a lot. And I felt like, God, I've kind of already mentioned this. Can I just skip this line? And I felt that he was saying, no, quite the opposite. We're going to go a deep dive today on the subject of forgiveness. And so I don't know about you, but I've always had this problem with this a little bit because I grew up in the church. And I would go to other churches, and everybody said the Lord's Prayer differently. It would be like, you know, some of them would say trespasses. Some of them would say debts. Some of them would say sins. And it was always this moment when you were in somebody else's church that you didn't know what they said, and you would do the Our Father or the Lord's Prayer, and you'd always stop right at that line to listen to what everybody else said, you know. Oh, there are debts here, okay. And then you would get the second line. You always had to stop on that one line. There's this one denomination, I can't remember who it was, they are really nasty about it because they did debts on the first part and trespasses on the second, so they caught you both ways. You know, you stop, oh, it's debts, and then you thought it was debts and it wasn't, it was trespasses. And this may be just me, but like, I have had a problem with this. It's like, I don't know if I'm the only one. But how can we have the Lord's Prayer, like the fundamental prayer that Jesus gave us and not agree on this very important part of it, and we use different terminology? Well, it turns out, I did a study on this, that when they were translating this, the translators were often coming from Latin into, into the English, because they kind of got Greek to Latin to English. And between all that, they ended up choosing different words as they came to it, because there's many different words that mean similar things in these languages. Not ours. You know, we have one, it's sins. But in their languages, they had others. And so you could translate it any one of those, debts, sins, or trespasses. Sins is kind of a new modern thing. Sins is going to have catch-all, the act of wrongdoing or disobedience against God's law. That's like catches everything, the sin. 
Um, but debts is also appropriate because it means failing in a moral obligation or duty. It's like there's a debt now that's owed. Because you failed, there's a debt that's owed. Like if I forget to take out the garbage on Tuesdays, that is a debt that is owed to my family because I failed at my moral obligation of taking out the trash. And in my house, if we don't take out the trash every week, we get overflown with trash by the next week, right? So that's a debt that I owe, and I have to pay that back somehow. So we have debts. Trespasses means somebody basically gets in your space. They've, they've not stayed in their lane, however you want to put it, and they've crossed over into your world in a way that they shouldn't have. That's trespass. Now, we don't necessarily hold the, the trespassing things as solid here as they do in some places. I saw a sign up once that said trespassers will be shot. Survivors will be shot again. I like that sign. It's very serious about trespassers, right? But this idea that you, that you get over you know, the line, you've crossed the line here. And, and, and so no matter which one it is, we're kind of asking for all those because we all have this. We do all these things, right? We sin, we have debts that other people could collect because we failed them and we failed our morality and, and we trespass, we cross over, we do bad things uh, sometimes to other people. For everyone has fallen short of the glory of God. We know that. We know that everybody needs this. And because of that, because everybody has failed in those ways, we know that we are all sins, sinful. No one is not sinful. This is from the psalm. This is repeated in Romans, but I like it from the psalms. The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand, any who seek after God. They have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is none who is righteous. No, not even one. So that's why you need a Savior, right? That's why you need forgiveness. And just so you know, I don't know, uh, we, we, we do this sometimes. We tend to think that people we like are good people and people we don't like are bad people. And so we can't understand why bad things are happening to the good people. And what the Bible tells us is, no, we're all bad people. And, and this shows up sometimes in prayers. You know, we'll, we'll be here at prayer meeting and someone will start praying for somebody and they'll be telling God all the reasons why he should heal this person. Oh, Lord, please heal this person. They're really good. They take care of the mother. They you know, pay all their bills on time or whatever. You know, all these things, they're, they're, they're a really good father. They're really, whatever, something. You always tell God all the reasons why he should heal them. And that's really kind of a bad prayer. Because what you're basically saying is, heal them, Lord, because they're good. But they're not. If you're ever standing in front of an almighty God and asking for healing, don't depend on their goodness. Depend on God's goodness. We're asking for mercy when we ask for healing, we're asking for something we don't deserve. Every person on our prayer list, I'm asking for God's mercy in his goodness, would you heal them? Not because they deserve it and somebody else doesn't. So that's just a point of it. Okay, so we're free from our sin because of this. We're free from sin because of Jesus. We know that. You have been liberated from sin and have become bond servants to God. You have your fruit, which is the fruit of the Spirit, which results in sanctification. It's a big fancy word that just means set apart for God's use. And the end result is eternal life. This is great. This is good news and better news. You get fruit in your life because you've been freed from sin, and that fruit in life eventually leads to eternal life. You just keep growing and getting closer to God, and eventually you're with God forever. That's the Christian walk, right? But it all starts with this idea that we have been forgiven. And as the Bible puts it, and freely you've received, so then freely you should give. This is, a, this is one of the things that Jesus tells his disciples. Freely you've been given, freely you should give. You shouldn't be holding anything back ever. And so in case you missed it in this Lord's Prayer that we did, we actually say this to God. Forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us. Here's what we're saying. God, you know the way I forgive other people? I want you to forgive me that way. So now imagine you're not forgiving somebody. Imagine there's somebody in your life who's hurt you, and you have even said to other people, I will never forgive them for what they did. I will never forgive them. And then you turn and go to God and you pray, forgive me of my sins the way I'm not forgiving them of their sins. You're literally telling God not to forgive your sins. That's what this prayer is. 
It's right there, but you miss it. And because Jesus knew the people would miss it, when he's all done with that prayer, he takes his disciples aside just so they don't miss it. And it's just funny because it's the only part of the prayer that he clarifies, the only part. Right after he's all done, I want you to understand this one thing, because most people miss it, he says. <laughs> he didn't say that, but he means it. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, he will not forgive your sins. Well, wait a minute. Our entire belief that we're going to live with God in heaven comes from the fact that our sins are forgiven. And Jesus just said, if you don't do this, your sins aren't forgiven. So what does that mean? I mean, does it honestly mean that uh, what's the result of the one who doesn't forgive? Is Jesus really saying, is he really saying, if you don't forgive, you're going to hell? Because it kind of seems like he is. Now, as Christians, we back away from that. We don't want to say that's true. We don't want to, well, yeah, but you have to understand, that's not really what Jesus means here. If you take everything into context, I mean, I actually read up on this a lot. I could find nobody who would emphatically say that's what Jesus is saying. But I'm going to go out on a limb. I'm going to say that's exactly what Jesus is saying. And here, here's why people don't want to believe it. Well, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe in him would not perish, but have eternal life. See, it's just belief. As long as you believe in Jesus, no matter what else happens, you're saved. Isn't that what that verse says? That's what that verse says. That's what we believe. You can go to a football game and see John 3, 16. It's like the most famous verse in the Bible. Isn't that what we believe? You don't have to do anything else but believe on Jesus, because otherwise it's works, and we don't like works. I don't think so. Because you know what else is not in that verse, John 3.16? There's nothing in John 3.16 that says Jesus has to die, be buried, and risen again. But we know that's part of our salvation, right? We know Jesus had to die. It's not just believing in Jesus. That wasn't enough. Jesus had to die for our sins. Well, that's not in John 3.16. What I'm telling you is there's no one verse that sums up the whole gospel. And what Jesus is saying is if you really believe in me, you forgive. And if you don't believe in me, you don't forgive. Because belief is more than just this kind of head knowledge thing. Belief is much deeper than that for Jesus. And it's consistent. Again, in case you think he just made it up one time and said something he didn't mean, and they got it wrong, which, by the way, it shows up in the parallel Gospels. They all said the same thing. But Jesus tells a story about this, and we know this story. Most of us have been to school or catechism or whatever. It's called the story of the unrighteous servant. And this is what Jesus says. He's telling a story. There's, and he's actually saying this to his disciples on the subject of forgiveness. Somebody asks about forgiveness. He goes, well, let me tell you a story. The kingdom of heaven is like this. It's like a certain king who wants to settle accounts. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one servant's brought before him that owns 10,000 talents. And that's different in different translations. It doesn't even matter. The number is huge, is the number he gives. It'd be like a billion dollars. Like, figure the guy owes a billion dollars. I don't know what he did. Got in some bad land deal in Vegas. I don't know how you lose that kind of money. But this servant owed a bunch. He could never pay it back. There's no way. That's how high Jesus sets the bar here. Since he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and his children. <laughs> okay. See, this is what slavery is in the Bible, by the way. There's two different kinds of slavery. The slavery that this country practiced was called chattel slavery, and it's evil and wicked. This was called bondservant slavery, which we don't do anymore, but um, it used to be a part of the culture. If you owed money you couldn't pay back, they put you in jail. And your family had to come up with the money to get you out of jail. And if they couldn't come up with the money, they went to jail too. And they would sell you all as slaves. And the money that you made as bond servant slaves would get paid back to the account. And when you finally paid it all back, you were free. That was actually what the slavery term in the Bible is about. But they're never getting out. He owes so much money that not only he, but his wife and all of his children are going to be in slavery forever. They will never pay back this debt. 
And so he says, please don't. Master, have patience with me. I will pay you all if you just give me more time. But he's not going to pay it all back. He can't pay it all back. How many times have you heard people tell you these kind of promises? Oh, let me, let me try it again. I can, I'll get. No, he's not. He can't possibly pay it back. The, the figure's too high. He can't get there. But the master of that servant was moved with compassion for whatever reason. He says, you know what? You're never going to be able to pay me back. So I will forgive the debt. You don't need to pay me back. Your debt is forgiven. That's a pretty good moment for that guy. Because this thing, you know, has been hanging over his head forever, and now he's freed. I'm going to forget the debt. And so he goes out, and the first thing he sees when he goes out, he sees a servant that owed him a small amount of money. It was like 10 bucks. Like he borrowed lunch money one day and hadn't paid him back yet. And he grabbed him and he chucked him by the throat and said, hey, you need to pay me what you owe me. And the fellow servant said, hey, please, please, have patience with me, and I'll pay you back all. Same speech that he just gave. This servant's giving to him. He says, nope, you're going to prison. And he has him taken away. When you, when you can get it all back, then, then, then I'll let you out. That's not fair, right? And word gets back to the master. And when he hears about it, he has that servant dragged right back into his presence. He says, you wicked servant. I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. And now, should you not also have compassion on someone who owes you so little? But I want you to see what happens now to the servant. He says he's angry and he delivers him to torturers until he should pay all that was due to him. In other words, he has to pay the full amount of what he owed, no matter what it takes. Now, let us take a look at this because it's a parable. It is a debt that cannot be paid, the same as your debt to God that could not be paid. Because there's nothing you can do to make yourself righteous. Nothing. And in fact, the scripture says, you were in debt your sins in your flesh, but God made you alive because he forgave your sins, having canceled the charge of your legal indebtedness. All the sin that's on you, that needs to be paid back, he took care of that through Christ Jesus by nailing it to the cross. It's a debt that could not be paid, and it was canceled in the story by grace alone. The servant didn't deserve to have it canceled. The masters took pity on him. That's called grace. It's mercy, right? And that's the same as you. He saved us not by righteous things, but because of mercy. Same thing. So we are the unrighteous servant in the story. What happens to him? He has to fulfill the full sentence of his crimes. What's Jesus saying here? If you do not forgive, you are going to fulfill the full sentence of your crimes. I know it's uncomfortable, but that's what he says. Forgiveness is the cornerstone of Christianity. We have to get this part right, guys, because without forgiveness, we don't have Christianity. The only reason you're allowed to stand before God and pray at all and ask him for anything is because he forgave you for his son's sake. That's it. You don't enter into a relationship with God without forgiveness. Forgiveness is really important. And Jesus is saying, as I forgave, so you must forgive. And if you don't, guess what? You're not mine. This is how they'll know you're mine. You're supposed to forgive like I forgave. I'm I'm going to say this is actually critical to salvation. But it isn't more than just that. Now, one thing I want to say is that um, it sounds like you're uh, talking about getting to heaven through works alone, Pastor, and I don't like that. I'm not talking about that. Or are you saying that if I walk out of here and get hit by a truck and die, and I just forgot to forgive one person, I'm going to hell? That's not what I'm talking about. This is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking not about, unforgiveness is not forgetfulness. Like, I just forgot to forgive that person. No, no. Unforgiveness is deliberate you know who you're not forgiving. You know who you have said, I'll never forgive them. You know who you take out from time to time, your little mind, the the little like rogues gallery in your mind of the people who've hurt you, and you're thinking, man, it really makes me mad every time I think about it. So you keep taking out and thinking about it to keep that anger there. 
because you don't want to forgive them. And you know that. Forgiveness is deliberate. So is unforgiveness. I'm not talking about something you forgot. I'm talking about something you've told God, nope. Because here's, what's, here's what you're doing. I want you to understand this. God, you're standing before God with all of your sin, and he's saying, I forgive you. And he's saying, in fact, Jesus' blood covers all sin of anybody who forgives. And we believe that. Paul was a murderer. You know that, right? Before Paul became the Apostle Paul, he murdered Christians. That's what he was doing. He was literally a murderer. God forgave him. We're okay with that. God forgave Paul the murderer's sins. But that brother of mine who hurt me, back when we were kids, I will never forgive because the blood of Jesus doesn't reach that far. That's what we're telling them. We're saying, God, you forgave my sins and Apostle Paul's sins and everybody else's sins, and that's fine. But that person's sins, don't forgive. I'll take care of that one. Vengeance is mine. And God's saying, then you're not my child because my children don't do that. My children realize that they needed forgiveness, and so do others. C.S. Lewis has a great quote. He says this. He says, everyone says forgiveness is a lovely idea until they have someone to forgive. Now all of a sudden it gets personal, and it doesn't feel so good. But listen, it goes beyond your salvation. Unforgiveness affects your life with God. If you wonder why your prayers don't feel right, if you wonder why your walk's not right, if you wonder why you try to do the right thing but just can't get to doing the right thing, I would start by asking, who am I not forgiving? Because it affects every aspect of your life. Jesus says this another time in the scriptures. He says, whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive them. Jesus is telling you that unforgiveness is affecting your prayer life. You're going to stand before God and pray for a healing. You're going to stand before God and pray for help. You're going to stand before God and pray for anything at all. Jesus says, get the unforgiveness out of your life. Get it out right now, he says. Because if you don't forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. Do you see how many times Jesus says this? He's not making a mistake. He means what he's saying. But it's affecting your prayer life. It's also allowing the devil to get into your life. I don't know, sometimes it feels like sometimes in your life you feel like the devil's got you by the sleeve, can't get ahead, he's like pulling you back. Just no matter what I do, try to read the Bible, I'll fall asleep, try to pray, I'm not going anywhere. I got these things in my life, these addictions I can't get out of, alcohol, drugs, sex, whatever it is, I can't get out of it. I have an anger, a temper I can't control. Do you know why that's so? Because Satan has influence in your life because you have given him influence in your life. Here's Paul writing in the Ephesians, says, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give a foothold to the devil. Unforgiveness gives the devil a foothold in your life. And one thing you need to know about devil, there's an old, there's an old Arab saying, if a camel gets his nose in the tent, soon you'll be sleeping with a camel. If the devil gets a foothold in your life, soon you will be sleeping with the devil. And he'll start influencing you. And you can get all upset about it. You can pray to God, please take this away. Please take this away. And he's looking at you saying, well, if you let the devil out of your life, I can do something. But you're permitting him in. And because you're permitting him in, he has influence over your life. And it causes all kinds of things. In a couple of weeks, we're going to all take communion together, and we're going to be going through the instructions of communion that Paul writes. And he literally says this, you need to check your heart before you take communion to make sure there's no unforgiveness in it. Because if you take communion with unforgiveness in your heart, you're taking communion in an unrighteous manner. And he says, and this is the reason why many of you have died. You don't think God takes this seriously? He takes this really seriously. And we're going to have to learn how to do it as well. So, let me, let me handle the, the counter arguments here. Because I know what some of you are thinking. You don't know what they did, this person. And I know. 
that some of you have been hurt deeply by some people in your lives. I know that. And you're going to say, they don't deserve. They don't deserve it. That's why it's forgiveness. No one deserves forgiveness. That's why it's forgiveness. But now what am I saying? I'm supposed to forgive everybody? Anytime? Just no matter what? Well, Peter had that same argument. He came to Jesus with this. Love Peter, because he's always, always working for us. <laughs> you know, he says, wait a minute, no. God, Jesus, let me. And, and Jesus has just told this story, right? And so Peter's like, okay, okay. Now, in the Jewish tradition, according to oral tradition, if a brother, a family member sins against you, you have to forgive him three times. After that, no, three times. So Peter's going to show off a little bit to Jesus. He says, oh, because I think, I think I see what you're saying. Now, you're saying if a brother sins against me, um, I should forgive them seven times? So he doubled it and added one. That's pretty good, Peter. I like that. I like where you're going with this. Let's get a good number that Jesus can give us. He says, no, not seven. He says, actually, the scripture reads, I tell you, 70 times seven. And I don't think that means we're supposed to get an abacus out, you know, a little time thing. And like, Man, when they get to 490, they are done. He's giving us a big number. He says, you don't stop forgiving. Why? Because when you stop forgiving, you give the devil a foothold in your life. For your sake, you need to forgive. Holding on to unforgiveness is like drinking poison and waiting for that person to die. It is amazing to me how many people I talk to who are angry with somebody for years. And I mean, around here, we're good at it. <laughs> like, we're basically just hillbillies, right? We have the Hatfield and the McCoys. We can hold grudges for generations. For years. And when they finally confront the person for this horrible thing that person did, they don't even remember. It's like, what's this? Oh, I'm sorry. I did that? Don't remember. They hated him for years. It like destroyed their life. Don't even remember. So that's why Jesus says you need to forgive. You need to keep forgiving. Get it out of your life. Holding on to unforgiveness is bad. So what, are we just all supposed to be doormats now? No. No, that's not what he's saying. There's a difference between forgiving somebody and reconciling with somebody. I'm going to show the scriptures on this. We have to forgive. But then there's this scripture. I love this little. This is the thing of beauty here. This is Paul. He's talking about it. He says, look, as far as possible, you should live at peace with everybody. You should. Don't take revenge, dear friends. And he says this. Leave room for God's wrath. <laughs> well, that doesn't sound very loving at all. That sounds a little ominous, right? Oh, it gets worse. Watch it goes on. He says, it's written, it is mine to avenge and I will repay. The old King James, vengeance is mine in the end, thus saith the Lord. I love the King James on that. He says, on the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. Because by doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Now, that doesn't sound too loving. That sounds like he's giving you a better form of revenge. <laughs> Let me tell you what this is like. My, my, uh, this is an old story for my family. I, had, I was a young kid. I wasn't there. But my brother was driving, my two, my, my brother, my father was driving, and my two brothers were in the car, the back seat of the car. And I'm guessing Tim was about four, and that would put Mike about seven, right? So picture that. Driving down the road, and Tim, the younger one, decides, I don't know why, he was going to get back at the older one. And so he's in the back seat, and all of a sudden he yells, out, ow, Mike. Mike says, what are you doing? I didn't touch you. And my dad up front driving, shut up back there, settle down. Well, he hit me. I did not. Would you both shut up? I'm going to turn this car around. And you're not going to like it, right? This is going on. It's a little while later, Tim says, ow, Mike, he said, stop it. Mike, I tell you right now, if, you don't, if I pull this car over, I'm pulling you out. I'm going to whip you. Stop it. A little bit later, one more time. Oh, oh, now he's pinching me, Dad. I guess he's not hitting me. He pinched me. He pinched me. He said, Mike, I've had it one more time. Mike was sitting behind Dad in the driver's, you know, the driver's seat, and he was right behind him. And he leaned forward in his seat, and he reached between the door and the, and the bucket seat, and he put his two hands on the back of my dad's arm. Tim was having way too much fun to notice this. And a little while later, Tim goes, ow, Mike. And that car got pulled over, and dad got out, yanked Tim out, and as my, my father would have beat the living tar out of him. Because he was not going to permit that to happen, right? Now, Mike is older. 
He could have hit Tim back when Tim was faking it. But what he did was better. He let vengeance go to the father <laughs> because dad can do a much better job <laughs> than Mike ever could. And this is a little bit what, God, what Paul's saying here you know, on one level. It's like, hey, leave it to God. And if you want to get vengeance done, God's the one who do it. But there's something else that's part of the scripture when you read it in context. God is just, and he knows exactly the correct punishment for that person. You don't know. You know how you felt by what they did. You know why you think they did it. But you don't really know what caused what they did. God does. He knows the correct punishment. And what we're saying is we'll trust you to do what's right. Whatever that is. Whatever you decide to do is right. You go ahead and do it. Have you ever hurt somebody without meaning to? I do it all the time. I have a talent for that. Ask my wife. I'm real good at hurting people without meaning to. And, and sometimes it's the most amazing thing. I had Debbie once tell Victoria, I think Pastor Grice is mad at me. And um, I think, she, I think I'm, I'm not going to come to Bible study anymore because I think he's mad at me because I'm too slow finding the scriptures. Now, you have to understand in our Bible studies, which you're all invited to, we have half of people coming in on Zoom. And we put them up here on the you know, screens, and you see all the little pictures. It's like the Brady Bunch opening screen, and these little pictures of all the people and everything else. And, and we're a bunch of us at the table, and we're talking, right? And we, you know, okay, we're going to turn to this, and we wait for everybody to catch up. She told Victoria that she saw me throw a look at her when she took a while. I'm looking at seven different faces, right? I, I, I'm not throwing a look at anybody. But she was convinced that I was mad at her. Thank God she's told Victoria and didn't just drop off the Bible study. Because so I thought, I'm not mad at Debbie. How could you be mad at Debbie? One of the sweetest proof I've ever had. And so I talked to her after church. I said, Debbie, I'm not mad at you ever. I'm sorry. If, if I did something, I may have been mad at Victoria that day, just being you know, reacting. But I wasn't mad at you. I promise you I wasn't. You know? But this is how sometimes offenses happen. You know, they're just misunderstandings. Sometimes. This is why we let God take care of it because he knows everything. So we have to let God handle it. We have to have the trust to let God handle it, which is what Paul is actually saying. But I'm going to show you something else. This Jesus says. This is right before he talks to Peter about the 70 times 7 thing. This is what Jesus says. And don't get confused because this looks like he's talking about how to handle discipline within the church, but that's not what this passage is. With all that as a caveat, let me show it to you. He says this. Hey, if a brother or sister sins against you, go to them point out their fault just between the two of you. And if they listen, then you've won them over and you keep that relationship going. That's the best thing that could happen. That's what happened with Debbie and me, right? She had a problem, something happened. She came to Victoria, I talked to her, everything was fine. This is ideally what happens. He said, but some people are stubborn and they won't listen. And so if they don't listen, you take one or two others so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. Now notice he does not say take two or three of your friends with you because your friends always agree with you. That's not going to help you. He's saying two or three people who saw what you saw and are unbiased witnesses, take them. So they can say, yeah, actually, we saw you or we heard you or that's what you did and you know, whatever. It's a witness. Now he should listen to that. But if he doesn't, if he still says, I don't get out of here, but yeah, you're wrong. Then he, she's, he says, you go to the church. And he doesn't mean get a microphone and tell everybody what they did. He means go to the leadership of the church and say, they did this to me. And then have a meeting and where the leadership, leadership of the church says to them, look, you can't act like this because that's not Christian. You need to apologize. Ask for forgiveness. That's what he says to do. Now notice what he says if they don't listen to that then you treat them like you would a pagan or a tax collector. Now, you understand that Jews could not even touch a pagan because it made them unclean. Tax collectors were Jews who were traitors. A Jew would cross the street to get away from touching a tax collector. They hated him. Jesus is saying, here's what I want you to do. Try your best to reconcile, but if they won't reconcile, get them out of your life. And then he says, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth, we bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed on heaven. He's saying heaven's blessing is on this. Forgive them. 
<laughs> Forgive them, but you don't have to sit there and take it. Get them out. It's okay. You've tried to reconcile. You did your best. They don't want to be reconciled. They want to be right. You don't want that person in your life. God's not telling you to be a doormat. But for your sake, he says, you have to forgive. You have to forgive. And if you end up having to move on, then move on. But you have to forgive. The last thing you do is forgive them as you leave them, as you put them out of your life. The last thing you do is forgive them. Forgiving is a process. You need to know this, especially if you've been hurt deeply. It's almost like you have to lance the wound, clean out some pus, and it has to heal a little bit. You have to lance it again and clean out some more pus and let it heal some more. It's a process. There are some people who have hurt you very deeply, and usually the people closer to you is the people who hurt you the deepest. And it's a process, and you have to continue to say, God, I want to forgive this person, and I need your help. I need it. I can't do it on my own. I'm going to have to have your help. Jesus knows this. This is why he says this. When he, says, he says, I'm sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be wise as serpents and as innocent as doves. He said, I don't want you guys to be stupid. Be as wise as a serpent. By the way, that might seem weird to us. A snake doesn't seem very wise. But in those days, actually, the snake was a symbol of wisdom. Even in the Bible in places. He says, you need to be wise. Don't be dumb. But be innocent. Hold nothing, hold no grudges. Paul has this thing that he does that I think is really good, and I suggest that we do it as well. Now, what's happened here, background here, is this is 2 Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians, some weird stuff was going on in the church, and Paul wrote a letter saying, that's got to stop. But that weird stuff involved people, and people take sides. And it created a rift in the church. And some people rose up and said, well, who's Paul anyway to tell us what to do? He doesn't live here. And so there was a lot of people who kind of were trying to kind of disparage Paul's reputation and saying a bunch of things about him. And the church itself loved Paul. Of course, Paul was the founder of the church, and he was the apostle over the church. And so a lot of them got really upset with this one guy who was causing a lot of trouble. And apparently they shunned him, which is a big deal back then. You know, if, if the Spirit Chapel shunned you guys, you just go down the street to a different church. But in those days, you didn't have a different church. That's why we don't do the shunning thing. It doesn't work real well in the modern day. But in those days, you're cut away from your society, your friends, everything. And so it was a big deal to get kicked out. And they were shunning him. And what Paul's saying is this. If anyone has caused grief, he has not caused grief to me. I want you to know my feelings weren't hurt. I don't care. I've, I've had things worse said about me. But he actually hurt you. But the punishment which was inflicted on him was enough. Enough. So you ought to forgive him and comfort him now because he can become so overcome with sorrow that he'll be lost from everything. I mean, sure he's sorry about it. Now, I want you to know, you should reaffirm your love to him, and anyone you have forgiven anything, I want you to know I have also forgiven them. I'm not sitting here holding any kind of grudges on anybody in Corinthian. Indeed, if I have forgiven anything, I forgave him for your sake. And here's my love, in the presence of Christ that Satan would not be able to take advantage of this. I am not going to give Satan a foothold in my life or that church. And so I will take my forgiveness in front of Jesus himself and said, Lord, I forgive them in your presence. In front of the cross of Christ, I put this down. I forgive them in your presence. See, it's one thing to say to yourself, I need to forgive them. I guess I forgive them. It's another thing to say, Jesus, Jesus, I forgive them. In your presence, I'm forgiving them. That's a whole different thing. Right? It's almost like a covenant between you and God. Now, sometimes what happens is then that person comes to your mind again and you find out you didn't really forgive them. <laughs> Here's the good news. You don't need a strong will to forgive. You only need to be willing to forgive. Don't know if you guys know who Corey Ten Boom is. I've mentioned her before. Very famous book called The Hiding Place. She and her family were Christians in Nazi Germany when they were rounding up the Jews. And they hid Jews to help get them out so they wouldn't be taken to the concentration camps. A neighbor found out about it, turned them in. And so the Nazis took that whole family to a concentration camp, even though they weren't Jewish. She went with her mother, her father, and her younger sister, who she was very close to. All of them would die 
in that concentration camp except Corey Ten Boom. Her sister was never the healthiest of children. And when they put in concentration camps, they made them work in the cold, in the snow, without proper covering. And her sister got pneumonia. She was in infirmary for one day, and the Germans made her go back out with pneumonia and continue working with the rest of them. She would die. She collapsed. They took her back in their infirmary, and she died. So Corey Ten Boom literally saw guards work her sister to death. As you might imagine, she had some bitterness towards those people. She did survive, and she got out. When she got out, she came stateside. Uh, she wrote the book, and she became a very famous speaker. And um, they asked her to come back to Germany to do a speaking tour. She didn't want to go, but she did. And she would go to the prisons and speak, not the prison camps, right? They're just prisons, because she had a great ministry there. Because when she'd stand up there, and she was this little thing, she's like five foot nothing tall. She'd stand up to speak, and of course, you can imagine these hardened criminals not listening a word she's going to say. And she would start by saying, when I was in a Nazi concentration camp, it was amazing how quiet the place got. And so she told her story, and she told about how she had to learn to forgive in order to heal and grow as a human being and as a Christian. And it wasn't easy, but um, it was something that she had learned to do. After she was done speaking, she saw a man walking up towards her. He was in a coat and a hat, but she saw him in a German uniform because he had been one of the guards. And she said when she saw him coming towards her, her whole body went cold. And she wanted to run, but she saw a slight smile on his face as he came forward. And she knew she couldn't run, not if she had just spoken on forgiveness. But in her heart, she was praying, dear Lord, make him go someplace else. I can't forgive him. And the man came up to her and said, I really enjoyed your speech. I want you to know that I am a Christian now, having given my life to Jesus. But you may not remember me, but I remember you. You were one of the prisoners where I was a guard. He said, and I came to ask your forgiveness. And I wonder, would you offer it? And he held out his hand. And she said, it felt like a snake coming at me. And I said, God, I can't do this. But I know I have to. And somehow, some way, she managed to get her hand to come forward. And she says, as soon as her hands touched, she felt this warmth come over her from the Holy Spirit that she couldn't imagine. And they both started crying. And embraced each other. She did not have the will to forgive him, but she was willing to forgive him. See, that's all you have to bring. You have to bring willingness to God and say, I can't do anything more in this. Only you can do this. But it's okay because we're transformed into the Lord through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will do the heavy lifting, but you have to be willing. You have to bring these hurts that you have been harboring to God and be willing to let go of them. Because this is who we're being reformed into the image of. They took him to a place called Calvary, and there they crucified him near the criminals, one on the right, one on the left. And Jesus said, as they crucified him, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they do. This is who we're supposed to be remade in the image of. And this person forgives. We need to all learn the beauty of forgiveness. Would you all please pray with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you that you continue to reach out to us. I thank you that your word is clear. We are harming ourselves by not forgiving. I pray that you will bring these people to our minds and give us the courage and a willingness to drop them at the foot of the cross and say, dear Jesus, I forgive them. Help me forgive them. In Jesus' name I pray.